Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for being a part of this great conversation we get to have about the beautiful game. I'm Phil Dark, your host. With me, as usual, is my co-host, my brother, Paul Jobson. Paul, how you doing? We're doing great, Phil. It's another day in paradise here in Waco, Texas. I think we're a, a month without rain and 100 degree temperatures. Besides trying to keep my, my four boys fed while mom's out of town, remembering that they need to eat every day, trying to keep the, the, the grass and the trees alive too. So it's been it's been fun. But no, things are great, Phil. We are, we are blessed indeed here and having a great summer wrapping up. School's about to start here pretty soon. So we're getting excited about sending the kids back to school. I mean, getting back into a, a routine. <laughs> Um, but, uh, no, things are great. How about, how about you, Phil? What's going on in Cali? Oh man, it's, we don't have enough time in this cause we got a lot more important stuff, but just a lot of craziness. Actually, it's that time of year where, uh, we're recording this beginning of August. So not only is women's world cup going on right now, and we do have the women playing in the knockout stages, we could, we'll, we will have a, a conversation about that at a later date. There is a lot there, a lot of material and, you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of the implications of a lot of things we've been talking about with, with many of our guests about the state of U S soccer, a lot of that's come out in this in this uh, World Cup, I believe. So that's a little teaser for a future conversation. Boy, it's been interesting to watch the the Women's World Cup and and seeing the different teams. It's been a lot of fun, similar to the Men's World Cup. Seeing a lot of teams that we weren't expecting to be in the knockout stages there. Um, Nigeria being one. You know, you got uh, Morocco again. Wow, who would have thought Morocco would have made the knockout stages of both the men's and women's? Some really cool stuff there. But I also, I love the beginning of August and the beginning of soccer season because it means I get to do some disc trainings and leadership development development trainings with some of these soccer teams and be able to pour into coaches to be able to pour into their players and uh you know be a part of some teams around the country which is uh, a ton of fun um as you know paul just that impact on the the college age just be such a time of discovery of so many different things and of growing as you know and who they are and finding forming shaping their identities and to be able to have a small part in that i just absolutely just brings so much joy to to me so yeah it's been awesome it's been crazy cool summer hard in different ways really good stuff i look in the next three months of travel and i just need lots of prayer for that my family my wife especially needs lots of prayer for that but yeah so but i'm i'm psyched on today's uh episode because as you know we have a we have a guest who is a is a good friend of mine we go back quite a ways we've we've been able to uh work on a book together which is pretty amazing you know we've been able to be on a team there together and we're on a team working working all around the world doing some different stuff too but with me and with us is peter greer who is the you know and i always know i was probably probably gonna get it wrong i'm gonna say president might be executive director of hope international and also played his college ball at messiah college which is a college that has is known for the messiah method and um just some great leadership coming out of that that school so super excited to have this conversation with peter greer peter how you doing brother i'm doing well looking forward to it thanks for having me on phil and paul yeah so it's the 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 question is it executive director is it president is it ceo is it all of them in one sla- bunch of slashes what is i think that people are dying to know no <laughs> yeah no the official title president and ceo so you can't get it wrong you got you have the two to choose okay from. all right so you know as usual we like to start every episode with just you know sharing your story some of these people a lot of the people in the soccer world probably don't know who you are in you know so i'd like to just hear how you developed your passion for soccer for leadership and how you did end up you know going from the fields of pennsylvania playing for messiah to leading this organization that's doing incredible work around the world for poverty alleviation well you both know this but soccer is the incredible door opener around the world and in my travels i after graduation from Messiah, ended up working in Cambodia and then in Rwanda and then in Zimbabwe. And now with Hope International, we work in 24 countries around the world. And uh, even today, where there is a soccer ball, there is friendship. And uh, bringing a soccer ball, connecting with kids on the street or in a field or just behind a school or something, it continues to be this absolutely incredible way of meeting people. And uh, truly, when I was living in Rwanda, you know, moved there, didn't have a lot of contacts. It was the first day outside of the place that I was living, just walking on the street and finding one of those soccer balls that actually was made out of plastic bags and twine. 
And uh, that became my community, <laughs> some young kids and then some older ones, and then ended up being part of the, the the ambassador from the United Kingdom, had a soccer team, and I got to play on his team, traveling around the country. And it just became, I would say that was actually the high point of my soccer career, was living in Rwanda, uh, being part of uh, this international team and having some rural parts of Rwanda that had stadiums that would be packed and I've never had a group of people seem to delight more in any mistake that I would make uh, than that group. Uh, but it just so <laughs> wonderful to make friends, so wonderful to have this game continue to be a part of my life. And I'm now at the stage that it's part of my kid's life and cheering them on and and finding great delight in that as well. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, the connection to soccer, a huge part of my life and continues to be just fun, a fun way of engaging friendships with others. And having this opportunity to have played in the U.S., but done some different travels around the world. And again, even today, uh, getting a soccer ball out, juggling with some kids on the street, uh, instant fun, instant uh, community, instant friendship. And I just love that. Yeah, you know, and that's something that I talk about with a lot of people is just the it is the world's most spoken language. Right. And as we do ministry around the world, you see that, you know. If you have a ball, you, like you said, you have instant community, you have instant. And then if you're good, you have a trust level that goes deeper than if you spent probably a month in their home um, with some of these people, right? The respect, the, the trust that you can build with, with these, particularly some of the, some of the youth and some of the young adults. And that's been some I've seen for sure. And I know you have too. Can let, let's, let's, you know, we'll get into a lot of the specifics kind of of the leadership stuff, but I want to just take a step back and, and love to hear from you just to be able to share about Hope International and about what you're doing. Cause again, a lot of people probably don't know, but it's something that I believe if people have a heart for the world at all, they need to know about what you're doing, but also how you ended up from, you know, what your journey to Hope International was. Yeah. So really it a couple steps before Hope International, I was an international business major. And as part of that was studying in uh, Moscow. And for the very first time, uh, heard about this idea about using business as a way to address poverty. And for me, that was really kind of the journey that I was on. I had this interest in business. I had this interest in the world and trying to figure out how do I live out my Christian faith in such a way that it makes an impact for people that are living on the margins, living in poverty. And that conversation in Moscow brought these different interests together in just an incredible way that captivated, captivated me then and continues to captivate me now. This idea, how do we use business? How do we use investment for good and a way of supporting local churches and living out our faith? I love that mission uh, that we are a part of. So we invest in the dreams of families as we proclaim and lift the gospel in the world's underserved communities. So that's what we are all about as an organization. And, uh, you know, the journey then after that moment, there always are a few steps between there and here. And uh, the journey for me was working for an organization called World Relief, doing fraud controls and prevention in a rural part of Cambodia and um Again, the connection to soccer, that was my fun there as well, <laughs> uh, being part of a team. And then uh, moving to Rwanda, spent three years living in Rwanda, running a microfinance institution, um, yeah, which existed. It was five years after the genocide when I moved there. How can we get capital to entrepreneurs so that they can rebuild? And um, you know, now with, with Hope International, we in the 24 countries, we, we serve in Ukraine as one of the places and similar deal. Um, how do you equip? How do you partner? How do you support entrepreneurs to provide jobs, rebuild their nation uh, right now? So that's been the journey that we've been on. And then I was in graduate school, went back to Massachusetts, which is where I'm from, and did my graduate studies and did my last project on Hope International uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that was really where I heard about this organization. And at the end of the, the grad studies, um, I turned in my paper. I don't remember what grade I got, but I do remember that at the end of that, I got a job offer from Hope International to join them. So more important than the grade, made a connection. And uh, now it's been 19 years that I've been serving with Hope International. So we moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is where we currently live with our four kids. And um, yeah, continue to work with Hope and try and figure out how can we invest in more families around the world. Yeah, and uh, I can say, folks, um, knowing Peter, doing some stuff with him, and uh, be able to get to know you, Peter, over the, the last 
20 years or so, not 20, probably 15 years, but for the two of us, really seeing how God's used you as a leader and to be able to see that. That's why I love getting you on here to see how you have developed, you know, the, a lot of those leadership school, uh, skills through the through soccer, through the the lessons learned, not just using it as fun, not just using it as a tool for a relationship, but to learn a lot of these lessons that we're going to talk about throughout this episode. And I just love to get leaders like you on who are actually living it out and are have been in a world outside of soccer for a long time, leading people and being part of an organization where, you know, I... I haven't found a guy yet. You probably know some people who have spoken ill of you. I haven't heard that yet of, of you, Peter. I, all I've heard is from everyone that's ever worked for you that, that you are a man who is leading well. And so thank you for doing that. But I also want to just, I, oftentimes we have people in the world of soccer who are using soccer, obviously, but to have that leader who's outside of that, I just, I love to be able to have that. So with that, we're going to get into a lot of the soccer stuff. But before we do that, what is your personal why? What is your life purpose? And uh, how are you living that out? Yeah, so, you know, I would uh, answer that question differently uh, in around 2007, 2008. Um, and I would have answered the why much more directly related to the work that I do that, please don't hear me wrong, I am still enormously thankful. But um, at that time, there was a change that happened when I realized that the path that I was on uh, was a path that, yes, maybe I would be involved in building an organization, but I would not have a family that knew that they were the uh, priority in my life. And there was a very significant conversation that had a dramatic change in the way that I lead. And so I would say the why right now, um, I want to do everything possible to love Laurel and to love Keith, Lily, Miles, and London. And uh, that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that these individuals that on this earth are the most precious people in my life, I want to make sure that they never question uh, if they are my priority, if they are the ones uh, that I value and prioritize uh, above everything else on this, on this earth. So that's my why. I want to make sure my family knows how much they are deeply and dearly loved. And then outside of that, <laughs> I do want to figure out how do we make an impact around the world and really figure out how do we re-energize a church uh, to be known for what we're for, not just what we're against, and to be for issues of justice, to be for the vulnerable, to be for those that uh, too often are forgotten or marginalized. Uh, I would love to be part of a church uh, that is known for that. Just to, to clarify, you know, Laurel is Peter's wife and those other names were his children. So just in case you were, didn't make that connection, just wanted to make sure we clarified that. But also, can you just share that story real quick? And, and you have it in one of your books, I forget which one, but the story of, you know, you did hit a, a point where, you know, your, your wife actually was questioning your commitment to that, right? At some level. And there's, there's a, a resignation letter and things like that. Can you share that story of, of what happened there? And I think it'll be interesting because I think a lot of people struggle with that in coaching. A lot of people struggle with that in the game of soccer. A lot of people struggle with that in their, in their positions, whatever it may be, is to, to, to say that one thing that, yes, this is my priority, but have it look very differently. So what did you do there to make sure that that never happened again? No, I think you're exactly right. I think it's for anyone that actually has a deep commitment and love for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. That That is a good thing. That That is a positive thing. The question is, uh, when that becomes an all-consuming thing, uh, who pays the price for that? And oftentimes, the people that are closest to us that end up paying that price that may or may not uh, be the, the right price for them to be willing to pay. So yeah, the, I remember it very clearly, Phil. Uh, the kids were in bed and uh, Laurel came and said, uh, you know, let's have a conversation. <laughs> and it was one of those moments, you know, you know, uh, <laughs> you need to be fully present uh, in a conversation. And uh, she started out by saying, Peter, I love you. Peter, I'm committed to you. Uh, but she said, I feel nothing for you. And if you looked at my schedule, if you looked at what I was doing, I was traveling a ton and even when I was home, I was not fully present. So that moment uh, became a change moment. And you mentioned the resignation letter. That was part of it. I think I got my head on straight for the first time and wrote my resignation letter, gave it to her and said, if you ever feel this way again, that you are not the priority, mail this letter because I will walk away from this job because I choose you and it is not a competition. 
And the amazing thing about that letter is, I mean, I love what I get to do. I don't want to stop doing it. And it it did change, I think, for the first time. She knew that she was the priority, but then it also did something for me. It was like a check in my spirit. That whenever I'm making decisions, I'm like, is this going to lead to the letter being mailed? <laughs> and, and so it changed some of my behavior and setting a travel limit. I'm not more away from home more than 75 nights a year anymore. And it used to be 110 and that was too much for that stage of family. So yeah, making some concrete changes uh, that still allow me to do this job and hopefully do it very well, but uh, to do it in such a way that is, yeah, making sure Laurel uh, knows that she is the priority. Yeah. I, I love that, Peter. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's uh, it's important for people to hear, you know, other people's journeys. And I, I think, you know, Phil mentioned it in the in the coaching world. I know from just personal experience, that's a difficult thing. I know it happens in in all lines of life and work. But it's like, man, you're you're providing for your family. You're you, know, you feel like you're doing the right things, but the reality is like, what really is the priority? Um, and I love the resignation letter thing. Not only is it uh, a testament to to your family, but also a reminder, like you said, to you of like, okay, is this is this going to be what what pushes the red button here for World War or whatever it's going to be? So, I love that. I appreciate you sharing that, and I think that's an encouragement to 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 so many people to to really understand too. Like there there is another way. You can get stuck in a, in a rut in a lane and feel like there's no way out. But I think hearing stories like that is like, hey, there there are other ways uh, around this to make sure that the priorities where they need to be. And as as a a Christian man, there's no greater calling than than to your family. So I, I appreciate you you sharing that. Transition a little bit. We've heard a lot about like kind of where you are, how you've got to where you be, where you where you be. I, where you be? Classes, where, you be? Where, you be? where you be? Where you be? I love it. You know. Yeah. Uh, I'm around my my <laughs> my kids too much. They're they're, they're threatening my my English. Uh, but uh, but we've heard we've heard kind of your story a little bit. There's a there's a missing nugget in there. We've not talked about your time at, at Messiah. And as a as a soccer coach, as a Christian soccer coach, you know, the Messiah method, like, you know, uh, it's a small school. Right. Uh, but a uh, a storied program of a lot of history, uh, a lot of influence, uh, not just in the soccer world, but in leadership and whatnot. Tell, you know, help us live vicariously through you a little bit in your experience at Messiah. Tell us about your time there. Tell us about the Messiah method, how it was utilized in your time there, and then maybe how that's influenced you as a leader now. Yeah, it is a special community. It is a special program, and I am enormously grateful for the opportunity that I had to be part. Um, you know, when I was a freshman, I played uh, junior varsity, and uh, I was also, I played lacrosse, and probably from like just natural ability, I probably was better uh, as a lacrosse player. Um, but watching the way that the Messiah soccer community um, had clarity about this is who we are and this is what we're about and this is the way that we go about it, uh, that has had a profound impact on my leadership journey. I went back to Messiah ahead time with one of the coaches, uh, and this is when they were in a series of winning national championship after national championship. And I wanted to just learn, like, what is it? What is it that is going on right now at this particular time? And that was one of the biggest things that I took away was just this, this clarity. This is who we are. This is the way that we operate. This is why and how and what we do. And I think for a lot of leaders, uh, where there is uh, ambiguity, it causes you to not have the ability to lead well. Uh, individuals know don't know what you're about and don't actually then know what are the priorities right now. And um, I just was so grateful uh, to be part of that program, to be part of that community. And uh, it has influenced uh, my journey as well as my friendships. Some of my closest friends are still uh, within that community. And there's a wonderful way that the alumni is invited into different events to connect with current players and, and uh, recognize that we are part of, yeah, not just this was our team back in the 90s for me. Uh, this is our way of staying connected to what is happening today and actively engaging. Um, and it goes so far beyond just soccer in those relationships and friendships. So yeah, enormously grateful. So yeah, I got to play 
soccer there. We like to say uh, in those years that we were the building years because it was shortly after uh, we graduated that uh, the national championships started. <laughs> so we, we were part of the uh, building years on that. But even then, it still was a great program uh, led by terrific coaches. And uh, again, the biggest takeaway for me is if you don't know who you are, if you don't know the culture you're creating, you're going to have ambiguity that is not going to help you drive toward the specific re results. So clarity, simplicity, repetition. Uh, those are words that I use a lot in the leadership journey that I'm on uh, now. And that uh, is a direct connection to, I think, what, uh, what has led to the Messiah team and community um, having that level of success. Yeah. I'll say from experience that the years where we had success uh, at our programs were the foundations were laid with the, the players who got no credit for it and the ones that came before, because they're the ones that really laid the foundation and really bought into the vision and mission of what was going on. Uh, and then the other, some of the later players got to reap the rewards of that, but also had to continue that as well. So I don't, I don't want to move past what you said, because I think you're kind of joking about that a little bit, but the reality is like, you know, that mission and vision and value starts somewhere and it didn't start with the championships. It started with the people that came before that who said, you know what, there's something different about this. I can really believe in this. I can I, I can fight for this. I can live this out. You set a, a standard and you set a base and you set a platform for the, the program to continue to build on. And, you, and it was so attractive because of probably your teams that the newer players like, yeah, we were, they're living this out. I can live this out. And then it built. And then, the, then there was success. And all of a sudden, everybody forgets about the foundation that was laid. And it's like, man, those players were great. What happened? Well, it ha those guys were great. And they did a great job, but it didn't start with them, right? It wasn't a flash in the pan. And then it was like, wow, we're great, you know? Uh, so I, I think there's something there to be said for our coaches and our players and our families to say, hey, like, you may not see the results of what the foundation you're laying right now, but if it is who you are and what you're about and you feel like God's led you to do that, stay with it. Stay on that path. And God will do with it what he wants, right? That's up to him. But don't get away because we're so – so quickly wanting success, right? But the reality is God, God will take that the way that he wants to. So I don't want to fly by that little piece that you said there of like, yeah, you know, we, we were the, the, the precursor to the national championships, you know, uh, but that's, that is the reality of, I think, how things actually, actually work. Speak into that a little bit of like how you felt like looking back on it now, can you look at that and say, you know, Maybe you didn't see it at the time, but can you look back at it now and see kind of how that all maybe started to build and unfold? Yeah, no, you're you're completely right. And you can look at individuals that were uh, before us and you definitely can mm -hmm. see this time of, of building. And I had the privilege. There were three coaches during my time, all uh, remarkable, very different uh, in their approach and 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 style, but uh, Brad McCarty, uh, who currently uh, is the coach, uh, a remarkable leader. He graduated just a few years before I did and came back to help. So uh, there was him, and then there was Leighton Shoemaker um, as well, a longtime coach, long time, just continuing to do the the, the right thing, and always had these uh, short axioms that maybe influenced kind of the clarity that came in the years to come, but he had always these short statements uh, that were powerful that would uh, guide us uh, that I still remember. And, you know, one of his ones was um, proper preparation prevents poor performance. You know, he's like, are we doing the work? Are we putting in the time? But then really after I graduated, that's when Dave Brandt became uh, the coach. And uh, that really is when the different season of, of success just started for the program and his ability to focus, his ability to yeah laser focus, hyper focus, on on making sure this was the very highest level quality program and team. Um, so I, I had the privilege of uh, working with him. And actually one, one connection with him is um, at the time, again, I said I was playing lacrosse. Uh, we had a coaching time that there was a transition in coach and I made the biggest pitch. I said, uh, you know, Dave, I know you don't know anything about lacrosse. You've never played before, mm -hmm. but you know how to win. <laughs> And you can learn the other aspects of the game. Would you also consider being coach of the lacrosse team? Because there was just something in him that was so unusual um, and so remarkable um, in his ability to, um, yeah, just cause individuals to play beyond, even beyond their abilities and to play well as a team and, and to lead exceptionally well. So 
yeah, he uh, that 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 is what uh, then began the new stage of success for the program. That um, yeah, I, I truly was not surprised. I was not surprised to see the success that came in the following years. Yeah, he's he's a remarkable coach and leader. Yeah, I love that you said that too about uh, Dave and you know, inviting him, so to speak, to come coach the other team. Uh, because those coaching skills and those things, they really transcend sports. You know, it, it really isn't always about the X's and the O's. It's about uh, leadership style, motivation, direction, vision, all those things. And, I, you know, I've said it a million times on this podcast. I spent a lot of time reading other coaches from other sports and and, and learning from them because it really is – it's about leadership. It's, it's about motivation, direction, all those different things. Mm-hmm. And it's less about the X's and the O's. Uh, you have to have those things, right? You can't be ignorant of the sport, but it, it's more about that. So I, I love that you you had that vision of like, hey, like you can have success in whatever sport it is. And I think that goes into just uh, the world of uh, of leadership, of whether it's business or whatever. It's, you know, what are those skills that you're learning from the sport of soccer, which is what this podcast is about? And how are you transitioning that into, into your uh relationships in, in your home and in your office and whatnot from, from your time, what is, what is maybe one, one thing that you've taken from uh, your Messiah experience that really transitioned really well into what you're doing and your leadership with hope? Yeah, I think we touched on it, but maybe just a little yeah. more detail is uh, again, the clarity of the Messiah method. <laughs> this is who we are. This is how we operate. And so on my wall here and within the culture of Hope International, we have the same thing. We know what our culture is. We know what we're about and we celebrate it and we live it out and we repeat it again and again and again. This is who we are as an organization. And, um, you know, one of them is a direct copy and paste from the Messiah method. But I, I just, you know, one of them is this idea of uh, grateful for everything, entitled to nothing. Uh, we want to be an organizational culture that is marked by gratitude. And I think back to that time playing soccer. That's how I felt. I was so grateful to just be on the team, to just be on the field, to just be part of this experience. And uh, it is earned. You're not entitled to anything. Doesn't matter what happened previous years. You are entitled to nothing on that. But grateful for everything. And and I just think that posture of gratitude is powerful. I think that does have a dramatic impact on a culture. And the opposite is true as well. Entitlement is corrosive. I deserve to be a starter. I deserve to have this. That is not a uh, attribute of a healthy organization or team uh, when those attitudes of entitlement uh, come in, as opposed to, like, I can't believe I woke up, I am healthy at 3.30, I get to be on a field on a beautiful fall day. This is amazing. And that is still how I feel um, on that. So yeah, and even looking back, still so grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of that program and that team and those relationships. And, you know, one other piece that maybe just on a personal level causes me never to forget that gratitude is freshman year, I had the opportunity to be called up to play in uh, a varsity game. And Paul, to say that I bombed is a complete <laughs> understatement. <laughs> I, 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 it was it was terrible. I mean, it just, it was terrible. Just like, uh, you know, deer in the headlights. I, it was against Gettysburg. I remember, and I remember coming off the field, didn't last too long out there. And one of the teammates just putting his arm around me and like, not even any words, like, sorry. <laughs> that was like, oh, and I was You've like, I cross, had my Peter. shot. I had was. my shot and it's gone and it's never to come back. And Again, the, to have the opportunity a little bit later, but to have the opportunity mm-hmm. when I thought that opportunity was gone. Um, yeah, maybe even that was, you know, maybe that That's contributed awesome. to just this sense of every day, every game. I am so thankful that I get to be part of this team with these people, with these friends. Yeah. So gratitude, yeah. not entitlement. Uh, that is a direct copy and paste that I want to have in my life and my leadership and in the organizations that I'm a part of. Yeah, Peter, before we move on, say the statement in its entirety again, because I think it's one that is so important for this day and time. Can you just read it word for word what that what that is again? Yeah, it's gratitude for everything, entitled to nothing. Yeah. Love it. And I think what that does, too, is remind us that entitlement is not a new thing. Right? So many people are like, (laughs) oh, this next generation are just so entitled. It's like, it's not new. And I, I went back and listened to some old episodes, and one of their early episodes was talking about that, how 
Entitlement, especially in those years, in the teen, early 20s years, is an entitlement. And it goes on. I mean, it continues. Yes, right? We still have that. I mean, even when I was taking the shuttle to train on leadership development and talking about not being entitled to things, I'm glad I had that in my mind because I was on a shuttle and it had, it broke down, it had issues, it couldn't go past 55 miles an hour. And I was sitting there and I just thought, at least I'm getting there. At least we're moving. I'm grateful that, you know, I, I, we're there and like, it was a great day. I wasn't stuck on the side of the road, like all these things. And, and, uh, it, it's so massive. It's so massive in our lives. If we can have that, everyone's like attitude of gratitude. Yeah, that's true. But just not just an attitude, but like a true, like if that is who you are, like you are a grateful person. It's part of our identity. So yeah, I mean, we could talk more and more about each of the things we're going to, it'll, I'm sure it'll come out in some of the different parts of the conversation of the Messiah method. Folks, if we talked about the Messiah method, that's actually a book out there called the Messiah method. If you're not aware of it, strongly, strongly recommend you go pick it up and we'll have that link in the show notes to get the Messiah method. Uh, Ziggarelli, uh, I believe is a professor at Messiah wrote it. He studied the team, talked with the different people, different coaches. And, um, he wrote that book, I think back in 2008 or so. So phenomenal book. I've read it. It's on my shelf. I was looking for it earlier. I can't find it on my shelf, but I know I have it here somewhere. Hopefully we'll get them on someday. We can, we can chat about that. But actually I think I talked with Brad McCarty about that game. Uh, he, he remembered that game when I was talking to him about you. So I, I don't know if he was a assistant or a help volunteer at that point, but he, he, he remembered it. So, you know, that, that's not just in your memory banks. That was, that lived on in the lore, I think of Messiah, <laughs> the, the, um, oh, dear. I'm sure, you know, when you speak, you know, when you do commencement speeches and stuff, I'm sure that it's, you know, the rumblings in the, oh, in, the, man, no. in the, yeah, he was the, the JV coach at okay, that point. Yeah, so he, yeah. he was the one who was kind of advocating for me to yes. get the shot yeah. and, uh, to talk about, uh, missing the shot. <laughs> Uh, shanking the shot, uh, shanking falling the shot. down when you're trying to <laughs> make the shot. All of the analogies <laughs> are accurate. I love that. You say that, it, it reminds me of what my wife often says is when I shank a shot, you don't need to remind me that I shank the shot. So um, that's a good lesson I remember in my in my home regularly is I don't need to, you know, I'm sure as you didn't need anyone to tell you that you shanked that shot. You knew and you didn't need people to rub it in. All right. So, but I'm, I'm glad we could bring it back up to uh, to have a little bit of, you know, trauma that may have that triggered in, in you. So you can continue learning from that, from that moment. But you know, we, we talk about this a lot, this collaboration that we uh, have in our, in our different organizations and the ministries that we can't do what we do by ourselves. Every book you've written has had a co-author, at least one. And that's on purpose. It's not just because, you know, because we know we do things better together, right? But what, you know, how did you learn, how did you see, you know, basically the lessons from soccer, Messiah, otherwise, even if you're playing in Rwanda, other places, um, how do the lessons from the game play out in the collaborative work that Hope does around the world? Yeah, Bill, I would say I'm probably wired uh, with a fairly competitive nature, whether <laughs> it is cornhole or ping pong, or doesn't matter what the sport is. I want to, I want to do my best. Like I just, that is just the way that I am wired, and 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 so given that wiring, when it comes to a team, right? The question is. Who is my competition? And if we're not careful, we can slowly start to think, and maybe we'd never articulate this, but we can act in such a way that my competition are the other teammates on my team that I'm fighting for a position for. Mm -hmm. Whenever there is a team that has that level of, it is me versus you, I guarantee that will not be a successful environment. That's when you don't make the pass, uh, even though the other person is open because you're trying to get it. That's when you do not have the ability to say, you know what, it's just not about me. And I think in a similar way with organizations, the tendency that we have is to define within the space that we operate, who's the competition? Well, it's these other organizations that are going after the same funding, doing the same thing, trying to get their name out there. And I think just as that sabotages a team, I think that poisons a sector, or sabotages a sector. If I ever identify other organizations that are trying to do good in the world, in the places that we're trying to do it, if I ever define them as the competition, as opposed to global poverty, injustice, hunger, uh, whenever I misidentify who the competition is, I am going to not cause us to have maximum impact 
and become, yeah, really taking our eye off of what is most important. So we do a lot to say, I mean, the phrase that we use at Hope is we root for our rivals. Anyone else who's doing good work within the space, any other Christian organizations or any other organizations in general that are trying to do good work in the places, what can we do to encourage them, to support them, to cheer for them, to be the biggest advocates for what they are doing, and to realize that our mission extends beyond just the boundaries of our organization. And uh, that has been transformative. That has opened up doors for collaboration and partnership that I know has allowed us to do much more good in the world than we ever could have if we were just trying to do it within uh, our strength, our organization, and what we'd be able to accomplish on our own. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I absolutely love that. And that's another book, folks. If, if you're struggling with that concept, go read Rooting for Rivals. It's it's It puts into words in concise way. I mean, yeah, it's a book, and so it's not 20 pages, but it's a very concise way to go, man, there are so many reasons why rooting for rivals, actually working with others, actually collaborating is so much better, so much more good can be done, particularly with these big issues around the world. And I'd say, you know, on these, on the smaller scale and a micro level, the teams that we're on, if we're, if we're not rooting for each other and if it's not an us mentality and it is a me versus them, um, or even just a me, um, which happens sometimes. It's not even, you don't even have to get to the versus them. You're just like, all you're out is for number one. Then you're not going to maximize. There won't be synergy. And uh, and we won't be able to tackle a lot of these issues around the world, you know? So on a, on a kind of similar related, but little different, as you're working with specific leaders that are, you know, partners with Hope or whatever, I know I have. I don't want to make an assumption, but I'm assuming, I, I am going to assume. I'm just going to assume that you've used some soccer analogies as you're trying to get points across around the world. You know, as we're working in our, sometimes we have language barriers, sometimes we have other barriers that are going on and we're trying to get a point across. And we don't, you know, we just know, okay, well, let's just use a soccer analogy and throw it out there. Have you done that? And can you think of one or two that you've used as you're talking with leaders and training up other people or, or working with people on doing something, trying to get a point across? And you're like, I just, I, I'm at a loss, but now I got to use the world's most spoken language. And here's a soccer analogy. Have you done that? And if so, can you give us an example of one or two of them? Uh, you know, I, 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 well, the one that I just shared uh, is is probably one that comes to mind is who is the competition on that and looking at the difference between the team versus the bigger story. Uh, so that is certainly one of them. Um, you know, the way that it is currently the conversation around soccer as it is currently being lived out is we are always cheering for the countries that are in the World Cup where Hope International has a presence. Uh, so we are cheering. We were cheering big time. Come on, Haiti. <laughs> we're cheering for Haiti. <laughs> yeah. And we're cheering for Vietnam. And we're cheering for, you know, the different places, Zambia. We're cheering <clears throat> for the for the Philippines and celebrating with them in the goal. And and uh again, just the sense of um, yeah, finding the way of of uh, of of knowing that we are united in hope, which means we care about what's happening in the different places and culture and we're cheering for their team, even as as the World Cup is, has gone on. So that's been the current conversation, not necessarily an analogy, uh, yeah. but a practice uh, that we have to be to be cheering. Yeah, and then I think the the um, you know maybe just as it relates to the story that was just shared, I do think a lot about uh, second chances. Um, and again, maybe that's just a personal story from there, but. But uh, we want to be an organization that is known uh, for grace, uh, grace extended, and that a, mis- a mistake, a failure, even a colossal one, uh, does not mean that you are permanently out of the game. Maybe it just means a little bit of refocus, uh, dust off, maybe a little bit better preparation uh, for the next time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to be known as an organization that extends uh, grace to each other, and that means leaning into failure. What do we do when mm-hmm. there's a failure? What What do we do? And uh, I think that's an interesting piece. Organizations that learn and grow just as a soccer team that learns and grows, you got to not be afraid to look at the game tape, but then not to be co- so consumed by what happened that it paralyzes you from being fully present in the next game. So how do you have that healthy balance of, yeah, let's look at the tape. We call them after action reviews. Let's look at what happened. Let's look at what we got wrong. Let's not make excuses. Let's look at what we got wrong. Let's correct that. And then let's our gaze be on the next game, the next time that we're going to be back on that field. Um, so anyway, I could go on, Phil, but those are some yeah. of the, the ones that come to mind. Ah, 
Love it. Love it. And we talked about that actually our last episode. We had a uh, Jonathan Van Horn. He's the he's the executive director of Pro Soccer for Athletes in Action. And he was talking about, you know, fail fast, fail often. He's talking about he who, you know, he who fails the most wins, right? This idea of failure as an opportunity. And if you're not, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And, and that idea is, is so important because we do see failure as something to avoid. Failure is bad. And, you know, and, and we just got to reframe that. And, and soccer is such a great, tool because most you know it's not quite like baseball where you're failing 75 percent of the time and you're still you know pretty darn good but you fail a lot if you look at any of the percentages out there on passing everything else doesn't take long for a player to do something you're like oh that was a mistake oh that was a mistake and these are the pros right so that's that's something that is so important for us and and i think it it's a grace-based versus a judgment-based and that's something that we need in life we need more of that in our world yeah Phil, can I just one one thing that relates yep. to that that I have uh, recently discovered? But um, so I have four kids, and two of them very active in soccer, doing the uh, multiple teams. And in Pennsylvania, there is a bit of a, a shortage of refs, and sometimes there would not be a ref that would show up. So initially, I just started running some lines. I love that because then I'm like fully focused. I'm not talking to other parents. I am fully focused on the game, and I love that. But then got uh, you know my my referee certification, and so I've been uh, for the last couple of years been doing a little bit of of refing. And what I have come to realize, Phil, it relates exactly what you're saying. But the number of times that the players and especially the parents, who is blamed for the mistake, it is the referee, and uh, <laughs> there is uh, oftentimes a little bit of lack of civility in how that is is expressed. But it just is amazing to me that if you are always looking for whose fault is it, I mean, both sides can at mm-hmm. least agree it's the referee's fault, uh, but <laughs> I don't think that's the way to grow and improve. And just the inability to own it, the inability mm-hmm. to say, nope, you know what? I actually uh, contributed to this loss. It's not the referee's fault. Uh, we did not play well as a team enough. To, 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 I just find that is a really interesting thing that I'm getting a personal glimpse at of uh, the, the ease that it is to find whose fault is it, which causes you not to have the ability to spend some healthy time saying, well, what could I have done better? And to mm-hmm. own the areas uh, that are not done well. Yeah. Well, even within an organization, creating that culture where it's okay to admit failure, right? I mean, you're kind of talking about, you know, you go back, you look at film or you call it after action review. If you create a culture where that's, where that's normal, uh, and I know before film review with our team, I'd always have to say, okay, before we start film, we're going to call some people out. It's not personal. You know, let's just, let's, let's, let's review what we're about to do here. This is for growth. Like this, we're going to be better after this. Don't take it personal. Um, other people will learn from your mistakes, but I think we're in such a, you know, uh, a culture now where people don't, don't want to take on personal, one don't want to take on personal responsibility, but one, you don't want to see, you don't want to be a, fa- you know, a failure, but as a leader, as a coach, whatever it is, create that environment where, you know, it's normal to, to talk about your failures and realize the growth that can come from it and realize that your failures are actually going to help someone else. It's not, maybe not even about you. And that's kind of what you're talking about, even with collaborative organizations working together. Hey, if you and I are working together collaboratively in an environment and I make a mistake and I can come to you and say, Peter, man, where did we mess up here? And you can clearly tell me because you're seeing it from a different angle. My organization just got better, you know? And, and I think that that's something that kind of to connect all of those dots together, because I've definitely seen in the nonprofit world, especially in sport, the first to market, hey, this is this is our space. We're mm-hmm. we're serving these these people. We're serving these young people. This is this is the territory God gave us. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's how it works. Uh, mm-hmm. But let's work together and let's serve more people. There's only you know we always want more resources. We need more people as organizations. Well, how do we do that? Let's bring on other organizations that have the same mission, vision, and value as we do, uh, and let's work through our mistakes together uh, and create a culture of that in this environment to grow uh, God's kingdom in these environments. So anyway, I get excited that just connecting all those dots together, Peter, that you're sharing with us is just really encouraging. Um, from your from your soccer perspective, you shared a story about, you know, your freshman year being called in. Was that your one defining moment uh, that we're going to talk about here on this on this podcast that kind of shaped who you are as a leader? Or there, is there another maybe soccer moment you had that really shaped 
some of your your leadership styles and made a, a major impact on, on on your career. Yeah, you look back and there are certainly are those moments that stand out. I don't know if there's one uh, <laughs> moment. Uh, Nobody but, has one, right? Yes, yeah, nobody has yeah. one. I just wanted to make yeah. sure that that one you shared wasn't maybe just the one. Yeah, no, the, what, there's another <laughs> one that, you know, is really... I think has made an impact in the way that I want to lead at Hope, but it was an odd moment maybe, but I was on the bench and it was an incredible game and we're in, you know, late fall, it is playoff time. And I was a junior at the time. This was a senior um, named Jer Sorzano and he scored this uh, great goal, ended up, you know, just like everything, just perfect. But after he scored this goal, he ran right over to the bench um, and had like this celebration. And I just thought that was the coolest that here he is, he scores this moment and who, where does he go to celebrate? He goes to people that weren't on the field Mm -hmm. at the time to celebrate with that. And I think so often, um, and this is maybe a direct correlation. What do we do to celebrate? Like at its worst, we look at ourselves, look at me, forgetting the other 10 people that are on the field that are doing this amazing work. And the second, maybe it's the person who passed. That's that's a step. But to actually want to go celebrate with the people that weren't even on the field, but are on the team, that just stood out to me. Yeah, as, as one of these highlights. And, and I think part of the reason it stood out because that was consistent with Jer's character. That was consistent with his leadership. And it was an honoring uh, encouraging um, of the team, not of the individual. Yeah, and 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 uh, that impacted me. And then also, you know, as as he graduated, I remember driving back on the bus. Uh, we lost a playoff game. You know, at that moment, Jer coming up and saying, "Well, great season. Uh, now it's your turn." And very much like just already having the ability to pass on. Uh, almost like, you know, like the father's blessing. How many of us, you know, have that experience of having like someone just commission or pass on or saying like, hey, now it's your turn and I'm going to be cheering for you. And so, yeah, I, I think about the way that Jer led as having a significant impact on on me and and um, both in that moment of celebration and yeah, as well as just that recognition of like, hey, the team goes on, I'm not going to be on it, it's your turn and we're going to be cheering for you. Yeah, that's so important. And I think that that continuity, as you talked earlier about the the team and the building years and all that, if you don't have those passing of the baton moments, it doesn't feel that way. And especially today with transfer portal and lack of loyalty, I was just talking to somebody about that today where you don't know if, if it's a freshman on your team, you don't know if they're going to be there next year because, you know, they might just for whatever reason, they might not like the hair color of the coach and go, well, I'm out of here. I want a blonde coach and we have a brown hair. I mean, it's not quite there, but it seems like it's on a whim nowadays, you know, for a lot of people. And yeah, there are some situations that are legit, but to have that continuity and to have that legacy and to have that baton passing is so critical in, in leadership, in ownership, in all of that, in, in, in business, as we know, in organizations, you know, to celebrate the next, to, to celebrate the successor, to celebrate the person who's better than you. That's, you know, one of the things I taught this week when I was when doing some training out at, a, out at a school was, was what, you know, what does it take to, to get to the point where you are um, so comfortable in who you are that you have no problem putting the captain's band on someone else's arm? You know, you can be the best number two. You can be the best number three. You know, to, to think of that idea on your death, but how many people can you say you raised up to be better than you, right? Like these, these principles that get lost when you don't have that continuity, when you don't have these, these teams that are developing and building and see that building is valuable because you can set the table for the next, you know, as opposed to, well, what's mine? Where's my glory, right? And to have that is... You're part of something bigger, right? And I, I fear that our kids and the teams now lack that most places. You know, there's not this something bigger that we see. So I love that, that, you, that you talked about all that. And, um, you know, 
we know that a lot of it starts with coaches and we've talked about a few of the coaches and it may be that, uh, you know, and, and just if you're wondering out there, folks, and you've gone to the United Soccer Coaches Convention, the uh, Schumacher, Leighton Schumacher Award is named after that Leighton Schumacher. There's not, believe it or not, I, there's not a different Le- Leighton Schumacher, you know, Schumacher, Schumacher, Schumacher. Um, that FCA award is, is after him. But so maybe it may be that him, it may be somebody else, but who is really that best coach that, that in a, that could be defined any way that you want to, um, that you've played for and really what's set him or her apart from the rest. And, and what have you taken from their leadership that you now see? And you've talked about a couple of the things, so it may be that same thing. It may be something different, but I just wanted to give that opportunity to, you know, what have you, uh, learn from a particular coach that you say, you know, I want to emulate that character trait. I want to emulate that from him. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. I mean, I did not have a coach, uh, growing up or high school that came anywhere close to what I experienced in college. I mean, it was wonderful people and, um, yeah, so thankful for that, but, but the, care, the attention, the focus, uh, of what I experienced at college was totally different. And it really was the three, uh, of that. So Brad and Dave and Layton, um, very different in their ways. And maybe that is the, the, the one takeaway is there are multiple ways, uh, that you can have, uh, yeah, build a great team. But I mean, Dave's level of focus and excellence, uh, unparalleled uh, of anyone that I've ever seen, I think about Brad and his uh, ability to encourage and take shots on people um, and very much, yeah, grateful. His encouragement in that, in that freshman year uh, definitely kept me in the game. So, so encouraging that willingness to take a shot on someone. And, you know, with Layton, it was interesting that I would say, so after he left coaching, he lived locally and he worked for a nonprofit. And I would say that's the moment that I became he wasn't my coach. Uh, he became a friend and mm-hmm. having lunches with him regularly until literally the, the month that he passed. I mean, I had, I had more time with him, more relationship after college than I ever did uh, during college uh, on that. And uh, I think the, the takeaway from him is um, yeah, he, he did everything possible to live a life of integrity uh, as a soccer coach in life. And I sure respect that to get to the end of your story and to say, I, yeah, I mean, he lived well, he lived well, uh, he lived for a great eulogy that was not all about wins and losses. Um, it was about the way that he treated people. Um, and yeah, I'm so thankful for those moments after college to have lunch, uh, country meadows restaurant that we would meet between <laughs> Lancaster and where he was living closer to Harrisburg. Yeah. For many years. Yeah, well after college. So super thankful for that, those moments as well. And coaches, I don't want you to miss that. Leaders, I don't want you to miss that. That so often we say, well, our role is while they're under our, you know, leadership as a coach of a team. But what does it take to become that leader that your players, A, want to um, be mentored by you, have relationship with you, be a friend with you? And B, that you're accessible to do that. And uh, that's, that's not, a lot of people retire and go off right off into the sunset and they don't continue that. But that, you know, is something that I believe true leaders will always aspire to, again, as to how do we develop those that we have been given the stewardship over to be able to truly not see it ever ending. And um, that's something that I talk to mentors about all the time. Look, if you're going to be a mentor, consider it a life commitment. And if you go into it with anything else, I don't think it will be nearly what it needs to be. And it, you won't have that fullness of it. So That's, that's great. And I think coaches just realizing you don't, you don't always know the impact you're going to have on somebody too. You know, and I think that's important mm-hmm. to, to realize. And I know I've had players that, I didn't think I had any impact on while they were, you know, in my, uh, on my teams and years later you hear that, that you did. Sometimes you never hear, sometimes you never know, but that character, that integrity, uh, I think that's what we should all try to try to 
achieve uh, to, to mentor and show to, to, to others. Again, you just never know the impact you're going to have. And I think probably all of us have similar stories, uh, Peter, of people who've made that, that kind of impact. So appreciate you uh, sharing that for sure. And, and Peter, let's transition. We're kind of winding down a little bit. This has been an awesome, awesome interview. Really appreciate your time and who you are and how you go about things. I've learned a lot just as we always do, Phil, in our, in our podcast, this is just such a, a selfish thing that we do for ourselves uh, here doing this podcast to learn so much. But um, Peter, you know, you've been part of the game. You, you played collegiately. Uh, you have children that play. You shared with us that you're a referee, you know, the most thankless job in, in the world, just taking it. You know, I think you should wear body armor when you're a referee now. That's why there's also a shortage. Uh, but you've, you've been involved with the game. You've seen it uh, in its purity uh, in, in overseas, just people playing just for the sheer love of the game, um, which is such a beautiful, that is a beautiful game in my opinion, but that's another story. Um, share with us what you think, uh, maybe some of the, the great things that are going on in our country with the game right now, and maybe some things that we could do better. Yeah, I mean, I'll directly <laughs> relate to the uh, refereeing experience that has given me a different angle uh, on that. What can we do better? Parents, relax. <laughs> 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 have, have fun. This is fun for yeah. most of these kids. They are going to remember uh, the fun of playing the game. Um, and many of them are not going to be playing uh, in the World Cup. So relax, have fun. And maybe, just maybe, uh, don't uh, try to fight referees after the games in parking lots when you disagree with the call. <laughs> like we, we definitely have lost civility uh, yeah. in the United States and how we treat referees. I mean, and my, my daughter was interested in becoming a ref and I really, I don't know if I would encourage that uh, mm. right now in, in the way in which parents have lost sight they, they, they've not lost sight on the score, but they've lost sight of what matters. Um, and the example that they have, the ranting, the raving, the words that are spoken, uh, that is the lesson that the kids are taking away. So maybe that's the lesson uh, coming out of the uh, recent referee experience. Remember, this is a game. Remember that it's fun to do, I mean, play hard. Um, but uh, I mean, let's remember it's a game and uh, be kind to refs. <laughs> love, love that that's that's a great lesson i think we could say that you know be kind to everybody you know these kids are just out there having fun right. and uh those poor referees in the middle of, middle of the field or on the sidelines are just 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 taking it and uh you know i i just respect and appreciate that you saw a need and stepped into it that's another great leadership lesson as well but um but yeah that that's uh relax i i agree um there's just too much and it's not just soccer i've seen it my kids play a lot of different sports and it's it crosses, um, you know, it, it crosses lines, sidelines from sport to sport to court to, to whatever. And um, yeah, as parents, we've got to got to find other ways to release our our tensions and our angers and our uh, our our other issues mm -hmm. other than uh, at our kids' events for sure. So yeah, absolutely. And then no, for I... those that are still playing, that may be the word to them. So I was uh, a few years ago playing in an over forty league with all my college friends. And mm. it was like the reunion tour. I mean, it just, it was great. And in our minds, we were back in college <laughs> in our bodies. We were not, um, and the <laughs> yeah. two collided a little bit as well as colliding with the goalie ended up having a pretty terrible, uh, break of my ankle compound, <laughs> multiple fractures. And that, that was, uh, that was the end of my, uh, competitive soccer plan. And whether it is in, a collision in an over 40 league or whether it is something less benign, um, more benign. But I think if those people are still playing, just have fun with it. It is such a great game. It is such a fantastic game and you will not always be able to play at the level that you're playing. Um, so if you're still in the game, I don't know, maybe just that perspective helps of saying like, it's a game, have fun. There is a limited season that you're going to be able to do it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. Maybe that'll help keep a little bit of the perspective um, as well. But it's supposed to be fun. And it is fun um, when we have the opportunity to be out. And man, do I miss it. Yeah, being out there uh, playing hard. 
Yeah, you know, and what you just talked about there, a couple things come to mind. One is that's really the doctor once re- referenced it as the stupid age when we are, are young enough to think that we can still do the things we did in our mid 20s, but we're old enough that our body is breaking down and we break ankles easier. And my wife went out around the same time and got a third degree sprain on her second game. And, you know, and so that that's one. And then the other is a great quote I saw at a friend's house. And it said, my body, my mind thinks I'm still 25 and my body thinks my mind is stupid. So I thought that that was another <laughs> good one. So a um, couple a couple things to remember for folks who are around our age that uh, go out and play, but have the goal of the game that you can go home that night and not have to go to the hospital that night. I think that's a very good goal that you can wake up in the morning and still go to work. Those are, and I think people take it too seriously at the age of 45 and 55 too. I've seen that at the adult leagues um, where they still think they're playing in college or in some very competitive match. So the t-shirt is pretty cool that you get at the end of the, the season, but you know, it's one that will go to goodwill in a couple years. So let's just remember those things. So anyway, um, that's well, there a could whole... always be a national team scout out there, Phil. You never know. You that's true. You get your chance. So that's true. You know, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I just need the game where you can just shoot like you do when you're warming up a keeper and you don't have to have a defender on you. Then I'm, then I'm good right now. Cause I can shoot like a champ in that setting. But the problem is those defenders always get in the way and, uh, it's not as fun. So anyway, um, that's just, that's just my problem. That's not what we're talking about today. All right. We are wrapping it up as we always say. All good things must come to an end, and I am bummed about it, but, um, you know, we'll have another conversation, no doubt. I mean, as we talked about on, on our other podcast, you've been on that four times, so hopefully this will be the first of a few conversations um, on how soccer explains leadership. But the last couple questions, the first is, how have you used the lessons you've learned directly from the game in your marriage and in your parenting, or and or your parenting? Yeah, I think the... Uh... The, the, the parenting um, one is probably a little bit more uh, direct correlation. I, I'm not sure about the marriage uh, connection, but but with the kids, I do think there's this element that sports have such a wonderful way of saying, like, let's push ourselves. Like, let's let's be excellent. Let's let's push ourselves. Let's not be afraid. And there's probably more gas in the tank than we think. Let's not be afraid of doing hard things, difficult things. And uh, that has been a big piece. I am not afraid to encourage my kids to think, to act, uh, to do beyond what they might think they are capable of. Um, And, you know, for the Messiah team um, during preseason, everyone had to run a five minute mile. Uh, That is not an easy feat. And I can tell you the only time that I have run a sub five minute mile is during preseason <laughs> um, when when you're there and and your body it can do more it can do more than you think so don't be afraid of pushing yourself sometimes yeah I think uh, not uh, stretching not stretching athletes uh, settling for mediocrity that actually is not love so let's uh, let's not be afraid to see what more we can do push ourselves a little bit further and we might even surprise ourselves that we're able to do a five minute mile so that's one uh, direct thing that uh, certainly has impacted the way that I think about parenting try to encourage our kids uh, let's do let's do tough stuff love it I love that we could have a whole hour and a half plus conversation just about that and, and maybe that's when we pick up another time for sure because I totally agree um, I love that I love that a lot Um Moving on to our, our last, maybe our last question here. Uh, what have you watched, read, or listened to that has most impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? I mean, there's no question. This podcast, you guys have had some great conversations and guests. <laughs> ding, ding, and ding, it ding, is ding, fun. Ding, ding, ding. Winner. <laughs> It is so fun to listen in and to be involved. Uh, Yeah, no, thank you guys for what you do and the conversations and the guests that you have. It really is fun to listen. Yeah, uh, I think I you're the first that. person to say that. So, um, you yeah. know, I don't Favorite know guest what that ever means. Now. I mean, he yeah, just, his I, status I, just went through the roof. It's already a great podcast. Now, this is probably just going to be on yeah. top of the top of the chain. Featured episode. On. Featured yeah. episode that. Yeah. And we just yeah. have this part, that part. We just have like a simple Pod, sound bite. Podcast podcast guest of the year. We just yes. implement yeah. that <laughs> now on the podcast. <laughs> and Peter just won the first first uh, first ever first one. 
<laughs> that balloon balloon day podcast. I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess I guess it'd be podcast day or I don't know. Whatever. Mm. Anyway, we're not going to do that because that would be too clunky. But I love it, Peter. Thank you so much for yeah. for your friendship. Thank you for uh, what you're doing with with hope and how you're leading a, a incredible team. As we talk about regularly, obviously it's not you doing a lot of it. But to, I think we talked about on the other on Think Orphan that it's 1.8 billion dollars has been kind of generated through the work um, oh. around the world to to alleviate poverty and to help people who are you know really wanting to achieve things that oftentimes we take for granted. And so thank you for, for fighting for that. Thank you for being a, a humble servant leader who, um, who loves really well. So I appreciate you, man. That's both ways. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Paul. So fun thank to have the conversation. Too. All right, folks. Well, thanks again for being a part of it. Thank you for engaging this. Thank you for um, just really, you know, like Peter said, there are some great conversations. So in addition to this one, um, go check out the other ones and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Give us a review. Give us some feedback. If you have guests that you think would be great for us to have on, please share them with us. And um, if you want to learn more about uh, the Messiah Method, all that Messiah is doing, we'll have that in the show notes. If you want to learn more about Hope International, we'll have that in the show notes. If you want to learn about Warrior Way Soccer, what Paul and Marcy are doing, or Coaching a Bigger Game, what I'm doing with Christian DeVries, please check those out in the show notes as well. And as always, please take what you're learning. We pray that you take what you're learning from the show and you use it to be a better parent, a better spouse, a better friend, a better coach, better leader, better in everything that you do. And continually remind yourself that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great couple weeks.